So, welcome uh, to the BOF. Uh, I had made a couple of slides, so I will show them and we can start speaking. Uh, so, those are the recent changes which uh, in the area, which are mostly GCC forting. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. So this, these are mostly GCC 14 changes. So we had the condition coverage and uh, uh, we have unsequences uh, by Jakub, which is GCC, which is only on the trunk. Uh, we have uh, value range propagation improvements and more ref. And I, I have spent a lot of time working on the CTD vector, which was a kind of interesting discovery. Uh, at least once uh, I found uh, this Foronix uh, data to be useful. Uh, so we turned it out to be much slower than Clank uh, on uh, JPEG XL. And it reduced into this very simple uh, benchmark, uh, which is basically uh, pushing and popping uh, data for, no, on the stack, uh, organized by Lipset to the C++. And as you can see, you know, we are much slower than, or we were much slower than, uh, than Clank. Uh, it's interesting that we were much slower only with our C++ library. You know, if I switch to the Clank C++ library, you know, the lib C++, uh, we was actually much faster. Uh, the Clank was doing the opposite way. So the Clank prefers our library and it's slower with its own library, uh, which is uh, sort of interesting. Uh, the problem is that this is the implementation of uh, pushback. Uh, and you can see it's not an easy, easy function. Uh, so, uh, you know, there was a lot of little work uh, to uh, optimize it. So some of them was done on the side of uh, libraries, some of them was done on the side of optimizers, some work was done on uh, local optimizers. So, you know, I had the slide from the previous talk, so, you know, we have made a lot of uh, commits. And, uh, uh, so, yeah, for trunk, I have a lot of things on my table, so I need to start merging because uh, I had a little bit busy summer and I was hacking but not merging. Uh, so, uh, there are some more ref cleanups which uh, I think are necessary because the path has matured and uh, it needs some work. Uh, Michal Jerez has uh, this very nice work on incremental LTO, which also comes with interesting cleanups. Uh, Ondra has this uh, loop histogram support, uh, which is useful, for example, for vectorizer to uh, do better uh, prologs and epilogs. And then we have uh, these two uh, Summer of Code students, which uh, uh, probably uh, needs uh, some cleanups and, you know, uh, and finishing the implementation. Uh, so. That's, uh, and this is uh, the things which I know that should be done and are not being done. Uh, so that's the wish list uh, for, uh, for the beginning of the discussion, I guess. So that's, yeah, that's it. So I prepared a thing more because uh, it's a buff. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I have heard that there's at least one uh, person with the new IPA work, right? So, so maybe you can say something, <laughs> yeah. Um, is it possible to plug in some slides? Hmm? Is it yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah, so uh, we're doing a bit of work. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm actually presenting work done by others in, my t in our team. Uh, so uh, there is particular optimization transformation that we want to make, uh, and IPA and LTO is kind of the best place, best suited place to do this uh, in our analysis. So the overall problem that we're trying to do is uh, we want to have. Um, colleagues and callers uh, that call each other a lot to be close together in VA space. Um, there are a number of reasons why we want to do this. Let's just say it's related to the trend with code locality that you know, tools like Bolt and others are uh, trying to uh, exploit. Um, it, you can think of it, I guess, as a hot code partition about it function level rather than at basic block level. Uh, it's, uh, 
it seems it's something we want to do when a bit when it's a lot really large program that may be using a lot of different APIs. So you know, if you call into an API, it will probably go and call a whole bunch of different things inside of it. Um, uh, so there is um, there are workloads that benefit from doing this. Um, it can be prototype hacked in a kind of linker script solution. So if you compile your program with function sections, then uh, run it, get the perf data, and then uh, associate the perf, uh, you know, the hotness data with uh, each section, and then have a linker script reorder it. You know, it it does the thing. It gives a performance benefit. Um, it's obviously, uh, well, if, if you look into it, uh, the, there are cross DSO effects that have a play here, but uh, uh, we we see there is value in having in having the traditional compiler workload do something here. So, you know, if someone uses just a well, well understood uh, GC workflow with the PGO and LTO, we want them to um, get some of those benefits. Well, it's basically, um, I mean, I say hot. I mean, I mean, if, I'm, I'm, I think I've called the calls a collie a lot. Uh, those two should be together. Um, that's basically what I mean. I'm not, I don't necessarily mean hot in a global sense. Uh, so it's, it's a relationship of uh, caller and collie rather than how hot an execution in particular uh, function is. Yeah, I think that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> maybe not picking the right words. Uh, maybe dark. So the exact heuristics are TBD, and uh, you know, it's something we would like to experiment with. Um, Yeah, so I mean, so we sort of want to express this a bit, um, you know, as a clustering kind of problem. Uh, so we want to have these clusters of code of code that you know calls each other a lot, you know, somewhere close to each other. Um, uh, so these would tend, as I said, they they would tend to be in different APIs. So a program has different libraries it calls, and you know, the library would call itself a lot. So you would have these kind of clusters. Uh, in your code graph, and uh, then you have uh, places where you know the different clusters or partitions, if you want, they kind of intersect because something calls in another thing. Um, so that's kind of general idea. So for the places where you have these uh, intersections between the clusters, so uh, there are sometimes we want to clone. We, well, we think uh, a solution is to clone uh, these things. So if you have a node that's uh, you know hot within one partition, but hot you know, it's called by another partition, then, you know, you, you, you need to somehow uh, make it so that you don't have to jump a huge distance to get to it. Yeah, so, some, something like that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to go into the microarchitectural details of this, but uh, yeah, basically the heuristic is, uh, you know, if, if multiple clusters want, you know, a particular node, then you want them to be able to access it uh, without a huge jump. Yeah. 
Yeah. So anyway, I, I guess the problem what we're trying to describe is we're talking about a partition and clustering problem plus a bit of cloning. Um, so that basically what we want to do. And inside the partition, we want to reorder them according to some heuristic that's derived from profiles or some static heuristic that we may come up with. Uh, Um, as I said, I'm not going to go into microarchitectural details. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's something related to really large programs, basically. Um, it's a bit hard to even describe in a simple way. Um, but eventually, I hope to get it. Yeah, there, there is a, so there, there is a heuristic to derive about the size of these partitions. So I'm not, they cannot be necessarily arbitrary. Uh, but I'm hoping that once we get the initial kind of algorithms uh, set up, this could be just a tunable heuristic that we could tweak. Um, so we've been trying to prototype it. Uh, in our team, we don't have a lot of extensive IPA experience, so we kind of looked at what works best. So in the prototype, we you know we have an IPA pass with the LTO, and we kind of, it felt as a natural place, the LTO partitioning part, it's because it already does the, all the partitioning stuff. So we prototype an extra FLTO partition equals locality, you know, we call it, and uh, that uh, clusters uh, the, the cold chain and then sorts them according to profile data uh, to keep well, to, to, to keep the various, um, you know, colors, colleagues together. Um, we also got it to do the cloning that I mentioned, but we ran in some phase ordering issues. Um, I think uh, one of those is that uh, like modref doesn't like if you clone after it, but partition happens in another place. So we hit a whole bunch of checking asserts about function summaries being out of date. Um, I don't think those are necessarily like blockers. You know, we, we can make it work. Um, so Prachi has sent out, uh, so Prachi Godbother who is doing uh, you know, most of the works. I think she sent out a question on GC recently about ICPC clones. So that's related to that. So if anyone can have a look or advice, that would be useful. Um, I mean, one thing that's sort of my mind is whether FLTO, you know, the partition part, whether that's the place to do it, because I got the impression that partition is supposed to be for like helping compile time rather than optimization. So I think we, we have multiple places that influence code layout. So one is the non-LTO related, where we order functions at X for how they end up in the assembly in, in reverse topological order or something like that, which we do for the GIMP optimizations mainly, I'm not sure, or maybe even RTL for the, the IPA RR. And so I, I think there was, was talk about making, rearranging the assembler fragments independent of that optimization decision of processing of the functions inside uh, a module. And then there's, of course, the as you figured, the LTO partitioning when you build a larger program, where we do basically the same. We order the partitions in a way to improve, first, the ability to optimize. So we keep calls and callees in the same partition. So it should already work somewhat to form these kind of partitions, probably not good enough. Uh, and of course, I think also to, to uh, limit the amount of duplicates we stream for inlining. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do wonder whether for, for stuff like that, if you want to drive that on the whole program basis, if it makes sense to introduce a second VPA phase, basically do the traditional partitioning and, and IPA optimizations, then do the local Gimpel and stream LTO bytecode again from the LTRANS units and then do this kind of late cache locality and whatever, maybe may re-estimate re, uh, profiles and then do the whole program layout shuffling for the partitioning. Yeah, so uh, uh, first, uh, we have a patch uh, with Martin Liška, you know, from many years ago. Uh, so basically, at the moment, the, the, uh, the way the partitioning works is that uh, we have the functions in the fixed order. 
Uh, by default, it's the definition order of the functions. So, you know, every C graph node has a number which is called order, and in that order we split the program. So the partitioning simply does approximately the same size chunks in that uh, order. And if you have the profile feedback, uh, then we have this uh, first run profiler, which is basically measuring when uh, the function was executed first time, you know, the average time. And then we order by this, uh, which was implemented uh, as an experiment uh, for Firefox. And uh, since then, we have very hard time to beat it. You know, it actually works. No, it's, it's not that bad uh, even for performance, even though it was uh, originally intended for startup times. Uh, so what Martin Lischka did, uh, no, he also read the board paper, and basically we implemented this, uh, uh, yeah, you know, uh, you, you take the call graph, you order the edges uh, by uh, execution count, and you try to make uh, the functions to be adjacent uh, to each other, uh, you know, as, uh, as well as possible. And then uh, you can rewrite this order and you can you know, get things partitioned in the right order. And then there is a problem that uh, you know, the light optimization is working in this reverse topological order, uh, basically uh, to help enter procedure register allocation and propagation of alignments and this kind of RTO data. So if we output the functions in the, in the order that uh, the caller is first and the callee is later, we lose all this, uh, all this uh, little optimizations. Uh, so my idea was uh, to implement uh, the gas fragments. So you know, gas allows you to fragment the text segment and order it in, in the order of the fragments, but it's the part which was never implemented. So uh, that's the that's the missing uh, part of this of this uh, infrastructure. Maybe you don't need fragments for that. You can just use the name section. If you yeah, yeah. Vertical pi and, and, and choose the numbers so that. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you link it together. Right? Yeah, exactly. But, you know, the sections have some overhead, right? You know, if you don't get the relaxations of jumps across the sections. And uh, so, yeah, so my idea was to use the fragments. Uh, but yeah, uh, Martin's patch was using sections, so he was having some kind of an anchor script to force it to be output in order. Uh, so, yeah, we can, we can do that too. Uh, so that's that's kind of you know I I will dig out the patch and we can compare what what we do. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, one thing is that you can really uh, you know like you know you use the partitioning uh, to get things uh, adjacent, uh, but we have uh, good enough control to to simply order all the symbols in the whole program and then do the arbitrary partitioning like we do now. Uh, which I think has the advantage that we can make bigger, you know, we can make right-size partitions for compilation performance and not tie it with the, with the code. Uh, so I think that might be, you know, advantage to what you do. Uh, yeah, I'm curious, do you have some data? Does it help? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll write more RFC mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, say, yeah, we want to write that in RFC of what we're doing. Um, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, yeah. We did develop initially on the GC12-based branch because we had. Yeah, we developed initially on GC12-based branch because some internal uses workloads that needed GC12 for whatever reason. But we are working on rebasing the GC15. Um, yeah, uh, and I say, of, of course, profile feedback kind of gives the best data to guide this. But we've been to see for users who don't want, cannot use PGO for whatever reason we'll think uh, about how we can plug in some static heuristics and play with those and see what those give. Um, yeah, assuming it all works, we would like to promote with GC15, mm -hmm. um, but you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes with implementation-wise. Yeah, because one, we're, one... We're hoping it won't be too intrusive to what's already there, so you can turn it on for when you need it. Because mm -hmm. one point when we stop with uh, Martin is that we was not able to get coherent speedups uh, on benchmarks we tried, to, you know, including Firefox, which I think should be a good test. And this TP first run, you know, the, the original Martin's heuristic on first order uh, was somehow always beating our implementation. So yeah, if you can do something better than that, it's already interesting. Yeah, we hope to come up with um, enough, you know, performance justification numbers. Um, I was sort of hoping that maybe GCLVM could be a bit of a could help there. I mean, we know that GCLVM benefit from PGO if you build the bootstrap PGO, and we are. I think there has already been some data that if you apply Bolt 
on top of that, you give us, you give us performance burn even on top of that. So we think there is probably something there uh, that could mm -hmm. hold there. So we're hoping to use GC as a, you know, as the best, you know, as the most easy, uh, easily accessible reproducer. But uh, we do have other workloads that are just a bit harder to extract and you know demonstrate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think benchmarking Clunk, you know, is probably, you know, it's a high giant binary, so uh, that might uh, might be useful. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. spec 2007 is too small. Yeah, 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 yeah I agree. So that's why we were trying Firefox uh, at the time. And uh, Firefox has this uh, benchmark when it's loading uh, like 50 most popular web pages and it's trying to scroll on them. And I think that should be precisely a good benchmark for uh, this type of optimization. And like uh, this uh, ordering by first execution is improving it by 15%, which is a huge number. And we was not able to beat that with, uh, with the other algorithm. But we stopped at some point and you know, that might have been just uh, implemented back or something. Yeah, I, hmm? I think uh, the, the first thing to solve is that fragment thing. So that, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ordering mm -hmm. by, by the order. Yeah, yeah. For, for some job functions, I think there is still no way how to tell the link yeah, yeah, so with LTO, you know, we have, you know, the visibility pass is taking most of the combats away uh, because we know that uh, it's not used by, uh, by the DSO. And uh, I think that that mostly solves the problem. And, uh, how does this optimization play together with uh, the ICF? Uh, with the, I didn't, because uh, the cloning undoes the what the ICF does. So maybe you want to differ or or do the optimization first and decide what you will want to clone and and uh, and not yeah. do the folding if it. Uh, yeah, that's something to be solved. I was hoping there was some kind of... Uh, that is something to be solved. I was hoping there was some kind of mechanism, like an attribute for somebody to say, don't ICF it. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure there must be... Yeah, it, it is a risk. We have identified that. But I think with the... Yeah. Yeah, my original approach to this was that we first want to identify as much as we can and then, then duplicate it again, either by inlining or... Actually, we didn't think of cloning functions. Uh, that's, uh, that's new in your approach. Uh, you know, we was only reordering, not uh, duplicating. Yeah, so it kind of, you know, GC already has the components to do most of these things, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. It's just that we want to combine partitioning and cloning together, and that's, you know, hits a number of past pipeline issues that I'm sure are very resolvable. So you, you could also use the, the, basically help the partitioning from the inliner to prioritize single edges from one partition into another that you inline that case, then you mm -hmm. don't need to clone, but you can inline. Because yeah. when you like try to maximize the number of independent partitions by inlining, mm -hmm. sort of. Yeah, yeah, well, the partitioner has some cost metric, which is actually taking the execution count into account. Uh, you know, it calculates basically the num number of calls which goes across the partitions, but it's restricted by this order. So, you know, if you give it a bad order, it will do bad decisions. And, uh, but the, actually that was uh, not the original design which I intended. Uh, it was the hack which I did uh, because uh, it increased, uh, decreased the size of partitions. You know, if you output, uh, output symbols in order, instead of random order, there is a less uh, types you need to stream into every partition. And uh, that thing is still there because uh, it, it works and I cannot beat it. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's, it doesn't make that much of sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, that's very interesting. So I, um, in addition to what I see here, uh, I think yesterday there was the, the, the kernel buff thing, which I mm -hmm. didn't attend, but there was the item posted on the mailing list about the, the global asms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, 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 I did, forgot did, to include did it. Did somebody attend and can shortly summarize? Yes. There was no talk at all about global awesome. Yeah, we didn't get that far in the buff, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, and we didn't get to the kernel LTO, which I put here. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So, what is the problem with global awesome? 
Well, the problem is that the global ASM, you know, what you do in global ASM, you know, you define some symbols or you consume some symbols, you know, you reference them. And GCC doesn't know it because it's just a blob of text. And uh, when we do partitioning, you know, we put the symbol into one partition, you know, the global ASM into other partition, and things break. Uh, you know, uh, Clunk is uh, slightly uh, less uh, aggressive on this because uh, the FinLTO works in the way that it keeps uh, the original files together, right? You know, they uh, basically compile the original files uh, in L run stage, and they pick uh, inline candidates from the other files. Uh, so we have better chance that uh, the ASM will not travel very far from your source file. So by being worse, they get better results. Hmm? By being worse, they get better results. Yeah, well, you know, they, they break less often. Uh, they also do some parsing uh, and because they have integrated assembler. Uh, but there are definitely test cases which you can make uh, the global assembler to break with Clunk, uh, you know, so it's not sufficient. You know, sometimes you need to rename a symbol because you have uh, 15 symbols uh, which are static and are called the same way. And then you would have to update the ASM statement, uh, and we don't do that. Uh, so, yeah, it's, a, it's an annoying. Uh, we could extend the extended assembler syntax so that it refers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, it tells the compiler it refers to these symbols. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I sort of. Refers these symbols. Exactly. Yeah, you know, to, we can do this kind of, kind of double dot for the global statements and put their inputs and outputs somehow. You know, we declare this and we use this symbol. Uh, yeah, I proposed this to Andy, and the kernel folks was sort of strictly against because it's work for them. Uh, and they say it works with Clunk, so you have to fix it on your site. <laughs> that was uh, yeah, my I, understanding. So I, I, I think, did, did you have a, a, a crude patch basically scanning the, 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 the string for the obvious defined symbols mm -hmm. and used symbols? I mean, we, we, can, we can do heuristics, but I, I think we should do the constraints. So at, yeah, yeah, the constraints. at basically... Uh, a way to, to specify the symbol that's used and, and make the text refer to it symbolically. So mm -hmm. then we can also do replacement and renaming. Yeah, yeah. and also symbols. also do the, the you know some some statements are actually defining symbols. Uh, so we need to do that too. Uh, so yeah, I'm not very front end uh, happy yeah. hacker. So if someone actually does this, it would be very useful. I think uh, that's a long time. Uh, problem we have and we have no solution. So, so the, the other possibility would be to just isolate partitions which refer to global ASMs. Which yeah, means yeah, also yeah. you can't you can't um, inline functions defined in that unit into somewhere else because mm -hmm. they could also refer to those symbols. Yeah so my plan actually is first to get the kernel compiling with this one to one partitioning. Uh, uh, things has changed, you know, the early LTOs, they didn't like one-to-one -one partitioning because uh, we streamed too much of uh, types. And over the years, this has improved. So actually, uh, uh, Michal had uh, some benchmarks in his, uh, in his bachelor's. And the one-to-one -one was producing, you know, comparably sized uh, uh, utterances as uh, the current partitioner. So I don't know, you know, it, it slowly fixed itself over the years. Uh, but, but one-to-one -one partitioning shouldn't be sufficient to solve the problem in full, right? Uh, because, we, because you're still in line across. Yeah, exactly. So it's not solving in full, but it will get us closer to what Clunk does. And because the Clunk is enabling LTO in kernel, they probably fix the bugs, which obviously comes with Clunk. Uh, so it might be a way to get in. Uh, there are two problems. Uh, well, there's this patch set from Andy, which is uh, no... Uh, kind of uh, maintained for a couple of times, uh, but uh, it's probably out of date. Uh, the other problem is that the LTO doesn't help the kernel, and I don't know why. Uh, you know, if you do, or you know, if you do the minimal config, uh, then things work sort of as expected. If you do the default config, then somehow uh, the LTO makes the kernel bigger and not faster, uh, which is disappointing and needs to be fixed to be accepted to, to upstream, I guess. No, no, it's without profile. Yeah, yeah, but even then, the LTO should do its job, uh, and it doesn't. And I don't know exactly why, to be honest. Uh, you know, I looked into it for a while, and I was trying to put on and off the options and figure out which is causing it. Uh, yeah, I didn't get to the answer. And 
I don't expect kernel LTL to actually make the kernel that much faster. Uh, yeah, because the kernel people do everything by hand, right? You know, there are many of them, so they, they can they can do LTO by hand. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. Uh, but I think uh, you know the LTO has other benefits, right? You know, it can make kernel smaller. I think that should be the initial selling point. And uh, once it's working, you know, we can do things like static analyzer on LTO and so on. So I think in the long term it's a good investment, but it's hard to convince Linux to accept a large patch set which is changing every global ISM statement in the kernel if there are no obvious benefits. So I think that's the problem. It is a great test case. Exactly, yeah. You should use the bike, those. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you say smart things, right? You know? <laughs> so tell me in advance if it's going, if it's going to be a smart thing or not. So um, for, for, the, for the global ASM thing, when, when we are extending the syntax, can we use the assembler to diagnose cases where the ASM defines a symbol or uses a symbol? But it's not using the new syntax, like where we, we put the app thing around yeah, yeah, around the assembler, so and, and, and we could put in extended app, so the assembler knows. Okay, now it's safe to define new symbols, and and diagnose it, otherwise. It could be some just kernel tool in between compiler and assembler that looks for these things. And yeah, because I mean, even if we add the new syntax it's of course optional and you we, we can't in the compiler if we could in the compiler diagnose the cases where mm -hmm. you need it then we don't need it right because then we can analyze the text yeah yeah well i don't know we can definitely you know take the statements send them to the assembler and ask him you know what what the statement does uh, but uh, you know, those are really fragments of code right you know sometimes they only work when they are together in the context and so on uh, so yeah, I, I have no idea how reliable the Clunk's implementation is. Uh, you know, if I try to break it, I, I managed. Uh, I, I, I suppose as they have an integrated assembler, they should better know what symbols are defined by the assembler. Mm -hmm. That would help. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we certainly can do some analysis. We already do for the line count, and but. That's just an estimate and heuristics and a wrong one. Mm -hmm. uh, but the question is, uh, many users rely on that uh, on our us treating inline as some as, as a black box, and they want to be uh, to have their anything like I think glibc just uses something which is not valid as some or and some tool that reshuffles it uh, and mm -hmm. so on. So. If we do the parsing, it should be at least optional. So we have an option that you are allowed to parse my inline assembler, <laughs> <laughs> or, or or at least have an option to opt out. So so do we have a kind of a set of test cases that show how the kernel defines symbols, so that we basically have a way to build a test suite inside GCC for whatever string parsing we could do. Um, Something colon is, is an obvious thing. Sure, but uh, I would expect in the kernel there are a lot of non-obvious things, and not mm -hmm. only the obvious things. The kernel is probably a biggest user of inline ASM for, st for stuff that is not instructions, for stuff that is uh, us. Uh, then they push it? section all the time. And, 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 yeah. and, and Excel, uh, Dot, dot, dot if and stuff like that, right? You don't see that much in other kernels. And you can always use ASM macros and stuff like that. So, yeah, so you, you can hide the, the defining of symbols right? so without actually assembling it. Yeah, so, so I, I, I wonder if we can basically use the assembler, the, the, the late assembler, which actually assembles the thing, to, to verify what we detected. Basically, if we sure are able to emit for the global ASM some assembler directive that says, well, we think the following lines will do this and that, and mm -hmm. have the assembler verify that for us. Basically, yeah, I think that put, should be... Put some, put some sanity. The us source language is too incomplete. So, yeah, you can. Well, we have to <laughs> amend it, of course. 
it's probably not going to be easy. It's not going to be convenient, but yeah, you can. Okay, yeah. we define gas micros. I <laughs> don't <Yeah>. do that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it would need some gas extension, right? You know, we will say, you know, here's a beginning of ASM, there's an end, which we already do, you know, we output this command. So it would be just a pseudo op. Uh, then, you know, at the end, we say, you know, we think uh, this was defined uh, and uh, ASM will error out if it wasn't. And, and this was used. That, that yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So that, that, would be, that would be doable, I guess. Uh, someone has to do it, though. <laughs> object file itself and then go through the linker back to LTO that way instead of having to like query <laughs> the assembler uh, during the first yeah. yeah. With mm -hmm. the magic option it could be pushed to a different section With so these details it start, start end of the assembler and it doesn't be assembler at all. What section it is? It should. For the range for the range so, so that you can <laughs> You can actually check it after assembler. You could just uh, emit a section which says here is the start of the assembler, here is the end, and and some encoding. The, we think this defines these symbols, and we think this uses these symbols. Sounds like a fun summer of code project. <laughs> plug <-in. laughs> Similar plugins that you know. I don't think Gus has plugins. No, no, I, I'm uh, GCC plugin that oh. I mean this extra stuff. Yeah, so someone has to step up and implement it, but then it will be cool. But for for the <laughs> uses of symbols, we actually want to be able to rename them Italy, and in that mm -hmm. case, you want to use percent one to yeah. something in. Mm -hmm. But because the current compilers don't accept that syntax, uh, we need some way how to do it conditionally. Well, so, so at the moment, it would mean that any use that we detect means the, the symbol is marked used. Basically, we, we can't rename it in that case. Of course, obviously. But, but the yes. syntax so that you can actually tell yeah. the compiler would be useful anyway. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so yeah. I, I think I, I think we, we should we, we should, should we should, we should definitely that, yeah. start with adding a syntax to make proper global asms. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, we probably want to get rid of global asms. But <laughs> I, yes, it, it doesn't have to be another another colon. It can be just just using the current it, syntax. Or it's, it's, it's a statement attribute. <laughs> That's not okay. 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 Can we have statement attributes on global things? Probably not. Uh, I don't yes. Yes. Yeah. But, but, but there are no global states, so global essence are special. They are not valid C, right? There's no global statement in C. Is there? Mm -hmm. No. no. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's local, uh, but. All statements are in functions by definition. But, so but yeah. the block, block scope uh, ASM is, is in C, C, standard C, and it can have uh, ASM attributes. Uh, but I think I only added it this mm. year, so it wasn't part before that. So in theory, we could have attributes there. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, we probably want to use the symbols with code, with M percent, whatever in the, in the text. So yeah, modeling it uh, as yet another colon is better. Don't don't steal one of the Dollar. one of the few Et. characters we have left. It has to be ASCII. Seven yes. bit. Yes, but we only have. No, few. it can be emoji, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we only have a few left. So uh, whatever we do to change the syntax should make it easier for the future to add other stuff. Okay, so, so, so propose new emoji for that purpose. <laughs> well, no, but there, uh, there could be things like uh, some. some uh, well, you, you can use the ampersand or whatever, but then uh, a string after it, right? And that, yeah. that can be used for all zillions of extra things. <laughs> we see. <laughs> the one who proposes the patch decides. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, the, the one who reviews. <laughs> <laughs> we also have similar problem in the ASM, in inline ASM. 
for uh, what in the manual is called uh, output modifiers. No, it's called uh, operant modifier. It's actually output modifiers. Uh, those are only a single character, and you can have only one. If you want two, you need to define an extra one that does both things in those. But it's only a single character, so you really run out of characters very easily. It's uh, well, did you, you you just add an escape character to be able to add second That's character? Oh yeah, That's what we use in constraints for years. Yeah. Yeah. So that last bit, late warnings are cryptic with LTU, LTO. What about it? Late warnings are cryptic. Yes, uh, <laughs> but uh, they are even more cryptic with LTO. So yeah. just get rid of them, maybe? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I, 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 I have no plan to do something about it. That's the vicious section, so someone has to do something. So I, I, <laughs> I think one of the, the issues is that we very quickly, quickly get to the situation to get rid of column numbers, for example, because we run out of the libcpp encoding. Mm. And but but otherwise, they are cryptic. Why are they cryptic? They they don't necessarily have to be cryptic. They are probably cryptic because we do even more optimization with LTO, right? So yeah, we all also warnings are already cryptic. Yeah, we also they, lose the ability to pretty print. In in one one compilation unit, and you call that function, and yeah. and the other one suddenly sees it's not varying. So so it's yeah. it's. It can be up to maximum and yeah. So so it, it's it's like when 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 the analyzer is able to explain the diagnostic now, um, that we should think how we can do the same for late diagnostics, which is I th I think um, the 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 guy from Oracle who tries to convince me looking at at the patch. It's, that's continues to be pinged about kind of adding to the to the location ad hoc data when you when we copy a block because of threading, so that we yeah, can yeah. later explain. Oh, by the way, I've threaded this branch to arrive at this diagnostic, which is the first attempt at kind of making those late diagnostics easier to understand, or better said, easier to ignore for the user. Oh, the compiler did something strange. I'll ignore that one. Right. The, the, the user needs to find out: was it my fault that I put the check in there, or was it someone else's fault, so, or, or the compiler that just decides yeah. it's nice to test something against? The someone. way I understand that uh, those warnings, the text of warning, uh, these first to stuff that is not in the user source code. Well, that's that's not true. It's just it's in the user source code, but not, not in that form. It's yeah. not in that form because, yeah, of yeah. course, it's not in that form. But basically, there is a path in the user's written program that is reflected by the code the warning is triggering on. And, 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 and so it's, it's... It's a warning on dead code. In the compiler, yes. Sometimes, the yeah, yeah. So, 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 so the, the idea with that prototype patch that I still have to look at, or maybe somebody else can look at, um, is that exactly we can tell the user that was the path I was kind of isolating in your in your program when I arrived to the idea that your program is buggy. And. But it's it's of course in, in but the other thing is uh, many many of the late warnings are VRP based or Ranger based, and explaining the decision why Ranger came up with this range is hard, especially because it might not be in the same path when 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 it uh, arrives at this value because there could be some other path that set the range for some completely different. Sure. I mean, it's 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 only a start of maybe is uh, an, an, an improvement to the current situation. I don't think there's the perfect solution to the to the problem. I mean, there's the other idea floating around that we 
should delay emitting the diagnostic because often the code is later eliminated as that, but we already diagnosed. Or, or the other option is, is to, to burn earlier. And of course, we don't do that much optimizations and then do the optimizations basically just for the warning's sake, try to propagate ranges, but it would, it would need to be interprocedural because you don't want to do it after IPA because yeah. after IPA, it's too far from the source code. And it's I mean, you, you could, for example, when you decide, I want to diagnose on this statement, you can now try hard, very hard to prove that the statement is dead by actually isolating the path from the function entry and op optimizing that virtual isolation to death. And most of the time, it's, it, we, we threaded something and then we diagnose, but the solution would have been to thread some more because then we would have been able to prove that this path is actually dead. Uh, so we could spend the compile time, which is then of course wasted because we don't actually want to duplicate all the all the code path, but spend it only when we actually emit the diagnostic, which should be not so often, hopefully, and then maybe we can prune warnings more aggressively that way. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, there are several things we we, we can do to analyze most of the warnings, and that, in that case, we can really spend more time on them. Yeah, that, that was this, so my my first reaction to the to the late warning issue is always yeah we should get rid of them or do them earlier, but we now have even in the early optimization pipeline threading which causes issues. You put it there. Yes, it's your fault. <laughs> it's my fault. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. but we need it. You know, it it, it really helps uh, you know to simplify the control flow. So, so, uh, we, so we, we are doing early optimizations to make functions smaller so that we can convince ourselves it's profitable to inline them. And more inlining helps, especially mm -hmm. with C++. Yeah, and also the jump threading is terrible to the profile updating. You know. uh, so if we make the estimate before jump threading and then we jump thread, uh, the profile goes crazy. So it's good to catch easy jump threading uh, early. That was the main motivation. Yeah. So maybe we have, uh, you know, here's uh, my student, Josef Master, he's going to work on this OpenNP uh, open uh, constant propagation and other stuff. Uh, so maybe we can try to discuss in the last couple of minutes uh, what would be desirable to get working. Uh, so this is Jakub, you know, he, he knows everything about OpenNP. So the basic idea for, for most of the OpenMP region outlining is that we basically create some callback that is called by, by the library and we pass it a blob of, of, um, of all the arguments and the arguments are sometimes passed directly, sometimes passed by reference. And, and so on, and, and we create everything as a structure, and basically the callback is passed with, with, a structure, uh, with a structure pointer. And so it would be nice to find out, for instance, if some of the stuff in, in that structure becomes a constant in the caller, or if, if what is passed by reference becomes, so basically it's, it's another way, and normal, normal IPA optimizations look only at the f normal function boundaries and usually just look at the, this is passed to this parameter or, or whereas uh, this is passed by reference, but not this structure that contains all the values. Uh, if, if it would help, then the OpenMP lowering could add magic attributes on the various uh, fields in the structure to tell if it's direct or by reference or something like that. If, if it would be useful to the propagation, that, it, it also Yeah, it would be useful. <laughs> or That's definitely great. it can mark the whole structure as I, I've created it and it's, it's for this purpose. And mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the structure is basically read-only, right? Uh, in most parts. It's once constructed and then it's not modified. Uh, uh, no. No? Of, often, for instance, it can have 
Well, uh, so so if if it's if something is read and write, so so for instance, last private variable, mm -hmm. it's it's uh, it's read 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 first and then written afterwards. Uh, but we know which one of those of the threads, yeah, or it can be reduction and r mm -hmm. uh, written by everything under some atomics. And, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it can be also just just a directly passed in and out. So so if we copy it into the structure and copy it out of the structure, that's mm -hmm. also possible. And yeah, yeah. Sometimes. Because uh, you know this is a little bit related to this lambda functions. You know those are also passed like a structure which contains the pointer and the closure. And we are really pretty bad on uh, inlining them because uh, very often we simply lose the track uh, that the thing is not modified uh, between the invocation of the function and invocation of the lambda. Uh, so I think the special attribute here would be uh, well, would make things uh, to work more reliably. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's, I, I think Ada, so with nested functions, we have mm -hmm. basically also a similar situation, of course, which is like... Yeah, 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 it's a, it's a similar no, situation. Yeah, I do wonder if, if like for the OpenMP case, we want to be able to, to clone the, the auto. So if you do IPACP cloning, mm -hmm. for if you call the same outline function, does it ever happen, happen that you call the same outline functions at multiple places? Probably not, right? Well, you can you can clone the unless you yeah it and, and yeah. No, what you, what can happen is that you it's once. yeah yeah. So you so but what we can't do is of course change the signature, right? Because uh, you can, but you would need to uh, change both the co color and and, and yeah. color. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, what can definitely happen is that uh, you know the, the kernel is called from somewhere and we know that the parameters are constant. So we clone the function which is invoking the kernel. Uh, so I think it would be good to have ability to, and, to clone and, the kernel. By adding a magic attribute, we can, we can tell really this function, this, this structure doesn't escape to anything. It doesn't, it's, it's not passed to anything else. Exactly, yeah. It's just that it's, it's not a direct call, but, but a, call through a library, mm -hmm. but otherwise it's, it's the same as, as normal calls. Yeah, yeah, I so, think so, the, the... So we could mm -hmm. have a normal, a normal function which is just past the, uh, uh, the arguments inside of a structure, and mm -hmm. IPA, SRA, and other optimizations already handle that. Yeah. In some cases. Mm -hmm. so, yeah so, so, so is that an also like mm -hmm. variadic arcs function when you pass the VA list to another function? So can we can we design something that also works for that case? Maybe, but Thomas, you know, he wants to speak. <laughs> uh, that that's just an idea. Um, if instead of creating this structure, this on blob, uh, we put all content of that directly uh, in the function signature as arguments, is, I guess that would be possible. So then, we, instead of one void pointer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, but yeah. If, if it's smart, then then and, and you find out it's it's only on run on PTX, for instance, you could uh, deconstruct the structure mm -hmm. and, and change the change the signature if you call it directly. But if it's mm -hmm. called indirectly, or I, I was thinking this way if or. Maybe just do that internally for optimization purposes and later construct this on blob out of the arguments that eventually remain, because then you could use the usual IPA optimizations changing function signatures. Yeah, well, and basically, avoid the indirection mm -hmm. through this on blob. Yeah, basically, my first plan was to simply recognize this comp uh, parallel. Uh, at the C graph construction time, and then at uh, additional edge, which will go from the caller to the mm -hmm. real destination, and there we can attach this information. So I think the IPA passes, uh, well, they, they will understand that uh, parameters go in a uh, in structure instead of uh, instead of uh, normal parameters, and things should sort of work. Yeah, IPA can also propagate constants, not ranges, and other stuff in uh, when they are passed by reference in in, in, in structures, in, like mm -hmm. stuff in classes. So in, in yeah. In this case, it can be actually double, in a double reference because 
That's that's a problem. Yeah, that's <laughs> something that we would need to generalize. To, mm -hmm. But 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 having an attribute like do it for this one because it's doable, uh, it's, it's most likely doable would, would would definitely help. So something like yeah, this function. Uh, yeah, if you see a store to this structure, it's only ever then read back after entering a call or something. I don't know. We would need, we would need to figure out some I useful think semantics. In Mark, this is only read. Mm -hmm. and this, this is and yeah, 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 exactly. That would be useful, yeah, I think. We, we know it easily, but when, when it comes right. But mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that idea of, of not actually doing a structure is, is also possible, mm -hmm. like deferring it until very late. Yeah, yeah. But we, we shouldn't, in that case, call dump uh, parallel and so on. But we would need to do. I, I have a special call with I something, yeah. Some language how to describe uh, these parameters are direct or mm. But I also think that what. And, and then turn it into a structure later. Yeah, what we really want to do first is just, just propagate information. If, if, we cannot, if, we cannot remove, if we cannot remove an argument that is basically a field of the uh, artificial structure, then I don't think it matters that much. We just, we, we know it's, there's a constant, so there, the field will be unused, but mm -hmm. I think in the first yeah. step, that's probably okay. It doesn't really matter mm -hmm. but that much. We are running out of time, you know, the other group is probably eating our food. So we should, <laughs> uh, we should go there. <laughs>